Why don't you grab a Bible? Find a Bible down here underneath your seat. No, find a Bible underneath your seat if you're up there. You'll find a Bible underneath the seat in front of you if you're down here on the floor. And I want to add my welcome to those that are watching from live stream as well and say hello to my grandson, Bauer, who will be listening to this. I want you to think back to middle school and high school and ask yourself this question. Who was the most influential adult, most influential adult in your life other than your parents? Coach, teacher, somebody you worked for, somebody else's parent. I want you to take a moment just think how significant they were in some of those difficult times that you were navigating when you were an adolescent. One of the fun things that's happened around Park is that we have a growing student ministry. And I'm an old youth guy years ago, and I love student ministry. And I was talking to our student pastor this week, Dave, David, and he was letting me know that the ministry is growing and more and more students are coming. But what we need is we need mentors. We need somebody like you to come alongside some of our students and invest in them. I want you to be that adult that if they think 20 years from now, they think of you and your investment. Now, some of you might go, man, I'm too old. Now, think about again, who invested in your life? It's not an age issue. It's a willingness issue. And for some of you, this might get you off the bench and into the game. So the way you can do it is that you can see here in the student ministry, that number that we use for just about everything, 62953 in your text app, and then just the word students, just the word students, and it'll connect you to a link. And I want to encourage you, seriously, be that person who invests in one of our students' lives and make that kind of impact that is so important. We are going to be texting today. I think once we get going and you hear some of the subject matter, you'll know that there might be questions that you want to ask, and we'll take time at the end to answer those questions. The way that you ask is, again, that number is 62953 in your text app, but in the, in the body of the text, you must put at the beginning, ask in in, ask in in for near north, no space. And, that will, uh, and then your question, that will get it to us. If you don't put asking in, another church gets it. And I'm sure that they will love to hear from you. But I would like to answer your question. So ask in, in and you'll know it works because we'll send a text back to you letting you know that we got it. We are in the midst of this series called The Glory of God on Display, reintroducing the church. And the reason we're doing it is because I've been bothered for months around what does the church look like? What does it mean to be engaged in the local church? I needed to reorient myself. I had to rethink about this as well. And so we're taking several weeks this fall to remind us of what is the church? Who is the church? And we talked about a couple of weeks ago, I shared with you that what is the church? Here's a definition we'll put up here for you. The people of God proclaim the excellencies of God. The people of God proclaiming the excellencies of God. And when we talked about this out of 1 Peter 2, verse 9, then Steve did a great job the last two weeks reminding us of the foundation of the church, which is the Word of God. It's God's words are the foundation of the church. And last week we talked about the gathering of the church. What does it look like when we gather together? What we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about the leadership of the church. How is the church led and I'm going to answer a series of questions that people have asked and things that people have been curious about around the issues of who leads the church. So let's pray and we'll jump in. Father God, we invite you into this space. Of course, we know you're here because you're everywhere all the time. But that invitation is for our sake, Father. We're inviting you. Would you whisper to us? Would you nudge us? Would you speak to us as you are so faithful to do? Fill us with your spirit for your spirit is the one who convicts us and encourages us and makes much of Jesus. Father, I pray that anything I would say that is not of you would it just quickly be forgotten. Father, I don't want to confuse anyone, but I claim the promise in Isaiah 55 that when I say your words after you, I know they don't return to you without you using those words and accomplishing your agenda in the hearts and lives of people. I trust that again right here in this moment. And Father, may we be, as James says, not merely hearers of the word, nodding our head, taking a note and forgetting, but may we be doers of your word, Father, engaging afresh with you and living differently towards you and as a result, differently toward others. Father, I also lift up Trevor to you, who's with the team over in China. We pray for Rev T. We miss him. We pray for safety upon him and the team. And may their work be fruitful. Now let me give you a moment with our heads bowed for you to pray for yourself. And maybe you just simply would pray this this morning. Father God, speak to me.
In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you ever done the, the uh, marathon that's going on today? How many have ever done it in the past? Let me see. Raise your hand. For you of us? Okay. Uh, I'm assuming you're not doing it today. Okay. Uh, I did this. Pardon me one time. For a second, it shut down. I did the marathon a couple of years ago, and I have shared with you before, I finished right before the police car who closed it down. <laughs> but one of the things I loved when I did it, a couple of things that I noticed is that there would be pacers. Let me show you a picture. There'd be pacers. You could determine how fast you want to finish the marathon, and you would find that person who was holding that sign, and you would line up around him, and that person was committed to making sure they could stay on that pace so you would finish at that time. Now, I was with a group, and I was listening to a, a pacer who was with a group. I was going alongside this group, and I loved what they were doing. They all wore their names on their jersey. And so this pacer, as he's going along, he was also encouraging them. Okay, Michael, you can make this happen. Come on, Julie, you can do this. I know it's getting hard. Come on, keep pushing. And he was great with them, just reminding them, come on, we're going to keep going. He was easily could have finished this thing way ahead of them, but he chose to go with them and get them there. His commitment was to get them over the finish line. The other thing that I noticed when I was doing it, there's a blue line that's painted all around our city. You can see it up there with the arrow. And so you don't get lost. You want to know where to run? Okay, follow the blue line. But I want you to know about mile 21, I don't care anymore. I don't care. And the pacer now, he knows where he's going or she knows where she's going. So she's committed to following that blue line because it's the shortest route. If you follow the blue line, it's the shortest route all the way around to get you where you need to go. So when you're struggling and battling, you don't need to find the line. You just watch the pacer. God has raised up a ton of pacers for us here at Park. Spiritual pacers. People who are setting that spiritual pace for us. As Paul says, we're running a race, and we run the race in such a way that we might win, as it says in 1 Corinthians. And these pacers come along, and they set the pace, and they know the direction, they know the blue line, and our job at times is just to go with them. And what their job is to is to look around at us and say, you can do this. Come on, I know this is hard. Hang in there. You can finish. You can do this. We call those pacers here at Park, we call them leaders. We call them leaders. And so today what we want to do is we want to talk about who these leaders are and what these leaders do, and we're going to do it through answering a series of questions. So here's the first one. Who is the church led by? Who is the church led by? Well, they're led by elders. Let me show you the three names that we find in Scripture. Elders, overseers, and shepherds. Now, if you notice, two of the names up there, if you play those out, Presbyterians and Episcopalians. That's where they get their name from. If you notice in the New Testament that elders are different from old elders in the Old Testament, elders in the Old Testament truly had age and gray hair. They are a group of men who determined the direction of a tribe or a people. In the New Testament, they're spiritually mature men who are raised up to serve as elders in the church. Spiritually credible men. When you look at what Paul did, and we'll see this in Acts 14 and Titus 1.5. It says, when they had appointed elders for them in every city. And Titus, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what, what, what remained into order and appoint elders. When Paul set up churches and started churches, one of the things he did is he appointed leaders. He appointed elders, our overseers, our shepherds to oversee the church. Elders and overseers defines the who. Shepherd defines the what. Shepherd defines the what. Now, who is our model for shepherding? Who is the model? If we are going to shepherd the church as elders, who is our model for shepherding? Well, of course, it's the great shepherd, Jesus. Let me remind you of Matthew, uh, what Matthew 2, 6 says and some other verses. It says, in you, O Bethlehem, where Jesus was born, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. In John 10, 11, we're going to look at this in just a second. I am the good shepherd. In Hebrews 13, 20, he's called the great shepherd. In 1 Peter 5, he's called the chief shepherd. He, first and foremost, is the shepherd of the church. We learn how to shepherd from him. All right, turn with me to John 10. Got your Bibles in hand. Turn with me to John 10. We're going to start in verse 7. It's on page 896. 896.
Verse 7, so Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep, which would have been a very encouraging statement, believe it or not, for them. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Writings of the time talked that the Messiah, when the Messiah comes, that he would be a door. And so Jesus makes that statement. One of the things he's doing culturally, he's identifying himself in his, in his uh, divinity, that he is the Messiah. Now, what is this door? What does that door mean? Let me show you what this looks like. It's for a sheep pen. Especially when you're out in the wilderness and following, and having your sheep and kind of following the pastures or following green grass. At the end of the day, you needed to keep your sheep safe. And so you would build a sheep pen either with thorns or you would build it with stones or any number of ways. And you would leave an opening where the sheep would go in. The door is where the shepherd would sleep. The door is that opening. The shepherd would sleep in the opening in order to protect the sheep. His job was to provide for the sheep. His job was to protect the sheep. And Jesus says, I am your door. I am your provider. I am your protection. The thief will come, but the thief's not going to get you because I'm here. Look with me at verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He was a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. I live in the doorway. I am your protection. The wolf is not going to come. If the wolf comes, I will give my life for you. Now look at that last phrase, I am the good shepherd, I know my own and my own known me. This became a reality for me when I was in the Middle East several years ago. We were out in the middle of nowhere and I came across a bunch of shepherds who were all taking a break and having a smoke together and all their sheep were mixed up. And they'd done, they flicked their cigarettes away and then one began to walk away and he did a loud whistle and a group of sheep got up and began to move and another went, yeah, da, 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 da. and another group of sheep got up and followed him and another guy said something different, another group of sheep followed him. They knew the voice of their shepherd. There was no concern about the sheep getting mixed up. The sheep knew, that's my guy. We know the voice of our shepherd. When we're in a relationship with Jesus, we know the voice of our shepherd and Jesus speaks and we follow. What makes Jesus the good shepherd? Look with me at verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 11, verse 15, verse 17, verse 18 says the same thing. We've talked about it in the past in Hebraic literature, the way that you... Uh, stress something instead of highlighting it or bolding it or underline it you repeat it and Jesus just repeats this thing four times I am your shepherd I live in the door I am your protector I will take on the wolf and the wolf for you and me is sin and death and Jesus takes on sin and death and at first, on Good Friday, at first it appears that the wolf is one. Jesus dies. Jesus dies. Then three days later, God raises Jesus from the grave as a reminder to us that he accepted the sacrifice. And Jesus lives. See, the interesting thing is that Jesus is our shepherd, but he becomes our shepherd by first becoming a lamb. He's a lamb. He's a lamb that is caught by the wolf, and he gives his life in order that we might know life. He gives his life in order that the wolf of sin is defeated. Jesus has proven himself by confronting the wolf and confronting the thieves and the robbers. But Jesus now sits at the right hand of the Father. So what he does then is he delegates authority. He gives authority to others to be shepherds on his behalf. 
We know we are loved and cared for because God has raised up other shepherds for our sake to care for us in the power of Jesus. Elders have delegated authority as shepherds. Elders have delegated authority as shepherds. But what the elders do is the elders then delegate authority out. Let me show you and just remind you the various people we have around here at Park that are engaged with shepherding. Team leaders and pastors and deacons and directors and teachers and small group leaders are all people that are engaged because we are committed as elders that we may not be able to know every one of you, but we're committed that someone knows every one of you. That there is a shepherd engaged in your life. That's why it's so important for us to see you engaged in a small group and engaged in a ministry where there's somebody who's coming along your side and knows you because the elders have responsibility for this whole flock. All right, let's talk about how are elders selected? How are elders here, leaders here at Park, overseers, shepherds selected? First, before someone is a shepherd, they're first a sheep. Before someone's a shepherd, they're first a sheep. We're looking for those who are good sheep that know the voice of Jesus, that listen to the voice of Jesus and obey Jesus. We're looking for someone that knows that Jesus is the gatekeeper and has a relationship with the gatekeeper. We're looking for someone who lives credibly, who lives according to 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. We're looking for those who are already engaged in shepherding. They're already engaged in people's lives. They're already exhibiting what this looks like. Now, just so we might understand the seriousness of the qualifications, turn with me to 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3. It'll be on page 992. 1 Timothy 3, page 992. Now, we're not going to read this whole thing, but let me just kind of cherry pick through here. Look at verse 2. He needs to be above reproach, sober-minded, respectable, able to teach. Verse 3, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. Verse 4, he must manage his own household well. Verse 6, not be a recent convert. Verse 7, well thought of by outsiders. And Titus has the same list. When we identify somebody that we see that is already shepherding and we think would be a good elder, we invite them into a 24-week course primarily takes place the whole school year. The first eight weeks, we're just talking about what an elder looks like. We're looking at all the scriptures, homework, memorizing scripture, reading stuff together to get our arms around what it means to shepherd. What does it mean to be a good elder and overseer? We then spend eight weeks on theology and look at what are the crucial pieces of, of our faith that we need to know and we need to understand, we need to be able to handle because we need to be able to teach. And then we spend eight weeks talking about leadership. What's the practice of this? What does this mean to be able to be engaged this way? If a guy makes it through that and we can still look at him and say, all right, we're ready, we got a spot for you, we ask him to fill out a questionnaire on theology, the application of theology. We give them life situations. What would you say to someone who said blank? We want to see them apply scripture. Then they go through that, then we give them an English Bible exam, the very one we also give to all the pastors who are going to be ordained. And it's extensive. All that goes well, then what we do is we do a background check, a state police background check on every guy. We know that guys come with brokenness. Every one of our elders have brokenness. But are they credible? Are they living lives of credibility? And then, as you know, after all of that, then we publish their name for 30 days. So if any of you have issues with them, you can address these issues. I mean, it takes a while to become an elder here at Park because we recognize how very serious this is, the role this is. This isn't a committee. This is a group of men that God has charged to care for this flock. All right, next question. Why only men? Why only men? Uh, I get asked this quite a bit. Based on the passages in 1 Timothy and Titus, we see that it is male-focused. I don't believe that it is cultural. 
The reason I don't is because in chapter 2, and I just remind you that when Timothy was written by Paul as a letter to Timothy, it didn't have chapters and verses. In chapter 2, which speaks about the creation order. Now what we do is we celebrate. If this is God's design, then we celebrate in God's design. This isn't punishment. This isn't withholding. We find joy in it because God has designed this, because God has said, this is good. Now I want you to know that as a church, that men and women are both of equal intrinsic value before God and are also both of equal value and importance within the church. We believe equal gifting across the board. Men and women need to use their gifts throughout the church, and there's plenty of opportunities for people to use their gifts here at Park, teaching, leading, whatever it might be. We have taught on this in the past, as recently as when we went through 1 Peter, and Don and I, my wife and I, chatted, talked on, taught on this together. We also don't want to bring our cultural preferences into the church, into what the Bible describes for us. In a culture where we seek to treat everyone identically without thought to gender, a church structure with gender and roles in mind, when functioning with humility and joy, speaks well of the power of the gospel. Now here's the question I get asked primarily from women. But what about a woman's voice? And you're absolutely right. There have been times when I've shared with Donna decisions that we've been making, and Donna said, if you had a woman in that meeting, and she's absolutely right. And so many times, if it's not something private, and there are some things that we don't share because they're private, we go home and talk to our wives about them. Because my wife's incredibly wise, and I would love to know what she thinks on these things. Or we talk to the women on our staff. Lisa B. right here is on my leadership team here for the Near North, and I trust her voice. Heather Goodall, who oversees our care ministries on the, near, or on the church-wide, near, church-wide lead team, I trust her voice. Or Jill, we have a number of women on our team that I listen to and trust. Or we seek out your voice and ask you, what do you think about these things? We know we need to hear other voices. Your input is needed and it's wanted. All right, next question. Why only a bunch of white guys? Why only a bunch of white guys? Well, this isn't necessarily true anymore. It's changing at Park. It's changing here at Near North, but it's also changing in our other campuses, more and more other locations, more and more. Our elders are looking just like the neighborhood. You know what we need to remember? We need to remember that 55% of the city does not look like me. 55% of our city does not look like me. And if we want to be a church in the city for the city, then we have to be very mindful of what it means to engage with others who are not looking like me. And if I may for a moment, those of you who don't look like me and you're here at Park, I want to thank you for hanging in there with us. I've chatted with a number of you, and you see what we're trying to do, and you see where we're trying to go, and you know this is a difficult road, and you've said to me, I'm here, Jackson, I'm here. I've rolled up my sleeves, and I'm here, and thank you. And you're serving all over the place. You're serving as deacons and teachers and leading teams and all small group leaders. Thank you. We need you. And the more and more as we in church grow and mature, we want to make sure we include a broader voice around our leadership teams. All right, let's get down to the nuts and bolts. What do elders do? What do elders do? Well, bottom line is they shepherd. They shepherd knowing that first and foremost they're accountable to the chief shepherd. They're not leading in place of the good shepherd, but they're leading on behalf of the good shepherd. Hear that again. They're not leading in place of the good shepherd, but they're leading on behalf of the good shepherd. The church is not ours. Park Community Church is not mine. I'm not the one that paid for this place. Jesus purchased this place with his death. It's his church. I just work for the guy who bought it. And frankly, folks, we are held accountable for how we lead. In 1 Peter 5, 4, it says, and we'll put it up here. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. It lets us know there's a reward for leading. But may I also tell you, it means also if we don't lead well, we'll be accountable for that as well. 
There's an accountability to our leading. Look with me at James 3.1. You know that elders need to teach. That's one of the things in Titus and also in Timothy. You need to be able to handle the word and teach. Look what James 3.1 says. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. I get up here and I feel the weight of the responsibility to handle God's word right. I get evaluated. Every message I get evaluated. Saturday night after I preach, we go to my office and we sit around and everybody gives feedback. We do that for whoever's preaching because it's that important that we handle the word right and well because we will incur a stricter judgment. Two qualities that must be true of every shepherd and they can be found in Psalm 78, verse 72. We'll put it up here. With upright heart, he shepherded them and guided them with his skillful hand. All right, let's break this apart. Let's first look. With an upright heart, he shepherded them. What does that mean? It speaks to the character of the leader. The character of the leader. It's like a pacer in the marathon. Follow me. Follow me. I know where I'm going. Follow me. I'm setting a spiritual pace. Elders need to be examples. Let me remind you of what Hebrews 13, 7 says, which we'll put up here. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their their way of life. Imitate, which we get our word from, mimic from, mimic their faith. We run with our pacers. And we go, how do you do this life? We look at them. How do we love our spouse well? We look at them. How do we love our kids and train our kids up well? We look at them. How do I date well? We look at them. They are our picture. They aren't Christ, but they are to be Christ-like. They aren't perfect, but they are to be credible. Sometimes, folks, if we're honest, we expect our earthly shepherds to be the good shepherd. the expectations that you have sometimes of your elders. And I want to remind you, we're not your savior. We are not your hope. But I sure hope we're pushing you in that direction. We as shepherds should model what the good shepherd looks like. Again, not perfectly, but credibly. Because we know that people catch more by what we do than by what we say. That we learn more from watching somebody, even from what somebody says, but what they do. And you should know that as shepherds, we don't find our value. We should not find our value from you, the sheep. And it's a battle sometimes because we're human and we struggle with wanting to be liked. We want to be accepted. But what we got to remind ourselves as leaders is that we have already been loved and accepted, that we have been sought, we have been forgiven, we have been received, we have been adopted, we are loved. That's who establishes who we are. That's who establishes our identity. When I know that fully, then I'm freed up to be engaged with you. But what can happen is that we can battle with this. 1 Peter 5, 2. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being an example to the flock. And there are times for all of us when we want to slide into some level of leadership, wherever it might be, because what we say to ourselves is, I want to feel significant. I want to feel important. I want to have authority. And we should run from those people. We get our identity from the shepherd. And then that allows us to be able to have the hard conversations with our sheep. Because if I'm worried about you liking me, if I'm worried about you accept in me, then I may not address the things I need to address with you or those who need to address them with me if they're worried too much about what I think of them. Here's the second piece of that. Guided them with, their, with his skillful hand. Guided them with his skillful hand. What does that mean? 
shepherd is guiding them. He's taking them somewhere. He's taking them where? To green pastures. So part of the things we do as a shepherd is we feed the sheep. Our responsibility is to make sure the sheep are fed. All teaching at whatever level here at Park falls under the guidance of our elders. What takes place on a Sunday falls under the direction and the authority of our elders. Small groups, care ministry, whatever we do, wherever there's teaching, we just had a family or we just had a marriage weekend. Even what that guy says falls under the authority of our elders because our elders have a responsibility to make sure that we stay on the blue line that we're heading in the right direction. Feeds the sheep, but also protects the sheep. A skill of a shepherd is to protect the sheep. Now, shepherds carry a staff with them. Let me show you a picture. This is a shorter one, but that's what a staff looks like, a shepherd's staff, and this guy is from the Middle East. There's two pieces to it. There's a long rod, and then there's a hook. Let's show you what they were used for. The long rod is to protect against wolves and other predators that would come to harm the sheep. And the hook, the hook is to be able to pick up sheep that have fallen. I just read an article this week in preparation for this, an article that happened in Turkey a couple years ago. The shepherds had all gotten together and they were having breakfast together and they didn't realize that there was a cliff. And one of the sheep went over the edge and they followed him. 1,500 sheep went over a cliff. I don't know if we realize that when we're called sheep, it's not a compliment. It's the job of the shepherd to protect the sheep. It's the job of the shepherd to protect the sheep against false teaching. In Matthew 7, verse 15, he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. It's the shepherd's job to be able to have the discernment to see This person is not trustworthy in what they're saying. What they're teaching does not align with Scripture. Have we addressed false issues, false teachings here at Park? You bet. A misunderstanding around the use of tongues. A name and claim it theology. Yeah, we've dealt with this kind of thing that we've had to step in and to address. And hopefully we've done it with great grace and great tenderness and great care. But at the same time, the thought is we must protect the sheep. One of the ways we protect you is by addressing tough situations in your life. When a sheep begins to stray, when they've lost sight of that blue line and they begin to stray, it is the responsibility of the shepherd to look at you and to challenge you and to call you back. And you know what happens? Sometimes we touch a very tender place and your first response is to resist. My first response has been to resist. But if we truly love you, as you have been entrusted to our care, then we are going to be willing to have those hard conversations for your sake. For your sake. Stay on the blue line. Get to the finish line. You need to know that sometimes when we have these kind of conversations, we always don't do them well. There will be times when we will not do them as graciously and as lovingly as we would hope. I was standing down front here a while back and I was having a conversation with somebody and I don't go all the detail but they were giving me a hard time and I was trying to be very gracious I thought I was trying to be very gracious and my wife was waiting for me and could overhear the conversation as we're walking out as only my wife could say to me she goes you were acting like a jerk and I said really she goes yeah don't you realize what you're saying get on the phone give that person a call I'm sorry I did not love you well. I wasn't as gracious with you as I needed to be. Will you forgive me? Your leaders will fail you. But let me remind you is that there's a greater shepherd behind us who will never fail you. What's our responsibility to our leaders then? If this is the responsibility of leaders, what's our responsibility to our leaders? 1 Timothy 2.2 says that we are to pray for them. We are to pray for them. 
Let me ask you, when's the last time you prayed for someone who's a leader in your life? When's the last time you really took them before God and prayed for them? You're a small group leader, your team leader, the deacon who's engaged in your life, an elder, whoever it might be. We need to be praying for those that God's entrusted our care to. We need to pray for them, and we need to encourage them. When's the last time you went up to a leader in your life and you put your arm around him and said, man, way to go. Thank you. I watched you. I saw you. I caught you doing this good thing. Maybe after they confront us and we're over it and we're not as tender, we even say to them, thank you for saying the hard thing to me. Thank you. We are to be teachable. We are to be teachable to our leaders. Acts 17, verse 11. We'll put it up here. Acts 17, verse 11. Paul is on a second missionary journey. He's gone to Philippi. He's gone to Thessaloniki. Now he's come down to a a city called Berea. Now these Jews who were more noble than those in Thessalonica, they received the word with all eagerness. They're teachable. They're listening. They're taking it in. Paul is preaching, and they're listening. But look at that next phrase, examining the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Uh, Paul, thank you, but i got to check that out. Oh, yeah, yeah, I hear you, but i got to check that out. See, part of us, we need to be teachable to receive what our teachers are giving to us, but at the same time, we need to check it out. One of the reasons we want you to have a Bible in your hand or your phone, whatever you tend to use, is we want you to follow along. We want you to see what we're saying. Your job is to check us. One of the reasons we do texting is for you to have a chance to push back. It's your responsibility to be a Berean, to listen eagerly, but to check. In the last one, we need to obey and submit Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. You know, I'm an elder here, but I sit under the authority of the elders as well. My job is also also is to obey and submit. We obey and we submit. When we address something in your life, we hope that you're hearing the greater shepherd's voice in your life. But if we would ever ask you to submit and to obey something that is not biblically based, you need to look at us and say, no. No. Show me that in Scripture. When you remind you in the end, you don't obey us. You obey the one who oversees all of us. And, and, if I may, don't be a pain in the butt. Don't be a pain in the butt. Look down here what it says, and let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. And sometimes you are difficult. I can be difficult. I can be resistant. And I make it hard for those who lead me. You know what else happens? And I learned this early on as a young pastor, that sheep have teeth, and sheep bite, and sheep hurt. And sometimes you say things to us that you would never want us to say to you, and you expect us just to take it because we're in leadership. We should never, we would never speak to you in some of the ways that you speak to us. And you need to know It hurts. It hurts. The reason we're talking about this and making sure we understand this is because in the sixth question of our partnership interview, how you become a member here at Park, we call it partnership. We'll talk about partnership next week. The question is this. Are you willing to lovingly submit to the leadership and oversight, to the leadership and oversight God has provided for us at Park through our elders? And then it goes on to say, in respecting the leadership of the church and the decisions and policies they make on behalf of the church. It's one of the areas that we sign off on the covenant. I signed it. Many of you in this room have signed it. We're mindful that God has placed these guys in our lives to oversee our lives as they live under the the authority of the great shepherd. Now, I know when I talk about submit and obey, 
that there are some of us in this room that are cringing right now. We struggle with that whole idea of submitting and obeying. For many of us, we struggle with being under the authority of someone. Even though we read it here in Hebrews 13, 7. Because how many of us are really thinking, I mean, who are you to tell me what I should do? I make my own decisions. I'm the captain of my own ship. For those of us that were raised in America, it is part of our experience. It is really at the heart of who many of us are. We resist authority because we long for autonomy. Now, we recognize that the absence of any authority is not realistic. And the Bible calls this in the book of Judges, each man doing what was right in his own eyes. But that doesn't mean we don't struggle with our willingness to submit to authority. Because frankly, we've seen examples of abuses of people in positions of authority. Certainly, we've all seen the newsworthy pictures of, on the part of coaches and professors and bosses. And this week, a Hollywood, Hollywood director and a North Korean dictator. We may struggle with submitting, with obeying, because we wonder at the end of the day if authority really is all about me establishing myself and my power over others. And yet I think that we would quickly follow someone who is humble. But for some of us, we have a hard time believing that humility and authority can go together. Can someone truly be humble and have authority? I think for many of us, the battle in our heart, in our soul, is really an issue of control. And yet we find in the gospel, we find in the presence of Jesus, we find these two things come together perfectly in him. Humility and authority. His humility is on full display in the giving of his life for those who have scorned him, who spit on him, who made fun of him, not just in his day, but in for 2,000 years since. We see his authority in that he overturns the tables in the temple that were right that right what was happening there and all the corruption that was taking place and he confronted religious leaders in the way in which they treated the people. We see in Jesus that in his death he laid down his authority, his rights, his power, his notoriety for the sake of others and yet the shepherd who was put into the ground was raised up as the humble king who sits at the right hand of the Father. When someone is in Christ, the proud are made humble. In Christ, prideful men are made humble leaders. In Christ, authorities for the sake of others, not to build one's own brand or platform, authorities to be used to serve and to lift up others. In Christ, humble authority is seen in the leaders of the church to lead toward the vision that Jesus has for this church, not what we have, building into others. Those that have been entrusted to our care as we pace this life together, we as followers of Jesus don't so much trust our leaders as we trust the one our leaders trust. The one who is in work in our leaders, transforming them into the character and likeness of Christ. When we as followers are in Christ, we learn humility. We learn what it means to release control. We learn to submit and obey. It's part of our growth. We learn to put aside our self-authority to be part of something far bigger than ourselves, this thing called the church. I have had the privilege now for 13 and a half years to sit on a team with elders and to be able to see humility and authority modeled for me day in and day out. Not perfectly, but credibly. Credibly. 